It is wonderful to be here this afternoon. I want to thank Coursero for the invitation uh, to participate and be with you for their Education Summit 2020. Um, it, it is an odd time in our history. It is an odd time for all of us to be talking about really much of anything. Um, one of the things that has been unusual really all, all summer and all spring is the era of uncertainty um, about where are we going, how are we going to get there, and who's right and who's wrong, and just trying to figure out the steps to take. Um, I have participated all summer long in um, countless numbers of podcasts and Zoom webinars and Zoom discussions um, that really have left me marveling over the number of people that are wrestling with these incredibly difficult questions and um, perplexing challenges. And so today, as, as I sit here with you and as I, I wonder about how to spend, or I wondered about how to spend our time together, um, I, I thought about it from the perspective of, of this one that, um, what we are dealing with at every level of our country is a failure, a massive failure of leadership. Um, and it really doesn't matter where you look, you will see epic examples of mediocre leadership, of people who simply, if we can be honest with ourselves, have not been up for the task. And not being up for the task, not being prepared for the moment is in, in many essences, just a fundamental failure of the most basic concept of leadership. At Paul Quinn College, uh, I, I teach our students that there are the two first rules of leadership. The first is you must show up, but the second is you must show up prepared, prepared for the task at hand, prepared for the moment. And so, again, as I thought about how best to spend our brief amount of time together today and about the lessons that I might be able to impart, um, I thought about my leadership journey and I thought about how I'm feeling right now today about everything that I'm seeing. And so it, it struck me that really what we're seeing is a war a war that's being waged between something called big L leadership and little L leadership. And so for our time together today, we're gonna to talk about big L leadership versus little L leadership. Now, sometimes we believe that leaders are these magical human beings who have been uh, rigorously prepared and you know they're in the positions they're in because they were better or because they've gone through the gauntlet. And to be honest with you, sometimes people are in leadership positions because one, no one else wanted them. Two, they just outlasted the competition. But you know, it's, it's, it's akin to being on, telling someone that they're a team player, but the only teams they've ever been on are losing teams. Is that the right version of a team player? Or do you want a team player who has been a member of winning teams more than they've been a member of losing teams because you do need lose, losing, you do need loss to help you understand how to be better, right? Of what it feels like, what it tastes like so that you don't ever want to taste it again because some people acquire the taste of loss and are just saying, it's not that bad. I am not one of those people. I implore you not to be one of those people, but others experience loss enough to learn from it, to move forward from it, to become committed to success because they don't wanna experience that. But some leaders didn't travel that path. Some leaders got to where they are because they embraced the status quo. They embraced being small. They embraced playing by the rules because the rules always worked for people like them, for people who grew up where they grew up, who looked like they do, who spoke like they do, went to the schools that they went to. They were told you just, have to play by these rules. And if you play by these rules, you will have a fine life. Well, a fine life for some represents death to others. And so as I thought about this concept of small L leadership and big L leadership, I tried to think about 
what is it that captures small leadership so well? Like who are the small leaders and what do they do? And so I wanna give you at the outset, some examples of small L leadership with the hope that you will never be these people. And if you hear these examples and you realize it's me, remember, you don't have to stay there. You can evolve, evolve out of the mindset, the practices that have led you to the small L leadership. But here are some examples of small leaders. Small L leaders traffic in fear. Uh, they, they hearken you back to the alleged good old days as if if you could just turn the clock backward, the good old days would be great. Well, here's the problem with that. For a whole bunch of people, including people who look like me, who have ancestors like mine, the good old days were terrible. The good old days were Jim Crow telling us that we couldn't sit where we wanted to sit or drink from the water fountain we wanted to drink from. Or worse yet, the good old days represented slavery where we were beat, battered, beaten, abused, and didn't have the right to learn, to acquire wealth, to do any of the things that would have made us happier or more viable in a capitalistic environment. For those who talk about turning back the hands of time, you must remember what represented the good old days. And small L leaders, small L leaders who use code words, who um, are, are folks who tend to dog whistle and, and say things like people are very fine leaders because they embrace white supremacy or are people who want to pretend that we can, we can embrace those who want to divide us and that that somehow leads us to a better place. And that brings me to the second characteristic of small L leaders. Uh, small L leaders squander the power of titles by focusing uh, on the excuses fostered by the embrace of a scarcity mindset. Uh, let me say that again, small L leaders squander the power of their titles by focusing on the excuses fostered by the embrace of a scarcity mindset. They want you to believe that what they can't see does not exist. They want you to believe that the room only allows for this much space or there are only this many people who can be great when the reality of it is, that's not true. And do not be lured into thinking about how small the world is, how small opportunity is. That type of, of mentality will lead you to insecure places. It will lead you ultimately to your defeat and it will not make you a great leader. It will make you a small L leader. I have always found it interesting to listen to people who tell me if I just would play by their rules, I could have a seat at the table. I don't want a seat at your table because your table is in a burning house. I don't want the little table. I don't want your little seat. I came for everything. I want to inspire my students. I want to inspire society that doesn't look at people and say, we only have so much and this is all it's ever going to be. I'd rather spend my time with people who say, how can we expand, not the pie, but how can we expand everything? Because no one deserves to spend their life in a life of scarcity, the inability to do simple things simply. That is not leadership. But that's the second characteristic of small L leaders. Remember the first is that they traffic in fear. The second is they embrace a scarcity mindset. The third, the third is even more despicable because these are the leaders who lead us into the dark corners without a path to the light. They are the leaders who tell you only about the doom and the gloom about the, the the unknown is terrifying and that people like you will no longer be relevant. So we have to tilt the game so that people like you can always be relevant, can always win because someone else is out there taking what is by your birthright yours. None of us have that birthright. And it is not right to lead people into the dark corners of their fears and their lives 
by making them believe that the only way to the light is to terrify them, to exploit others, to belittle others, to treat others as if they don't belong here, they don't have a home. I, I am fascinated by the fact that we live in a country whose founding documents espouse liberty and justice for all, and then define themselves as a small group of people who were the only ones that these principles applied to. We are the country that the Statue of Liberty uh, invites us, beckons those of us from foreign lands who have struggled in other places to come and, and feel the bounty of our maj majesty. And now we are supposed to be a country that suddenly doesn't have enough because those who come don't look like those who came, who by the way, were not the ones who were the, the native born Americans. And I, I want you to understand the irony of that, that we have built a country by waging war on others when those who invaded the land were the others. And so now, now we look around and we say, um, we no longer want people who come from foreign lands to have a home here. Our entire way of life was built on welcoming those from other places. But small L leaders do that. They do that. They tell you that innovation is evil. They tell you that they can't do something different. And they tell you that they can't do something different because different wouldn't be good for you. Now, I, I wanna speak directly to my higher ed brethren who have trafficked it in this fear, telling our students that you don't want an online experience because the online education is inferior. And to that, I, I, I would tell those small L leaders, I would challenge them with this question, how exactly is it that every other industry has figured out how to create meaningful, engaging experiences online but the people who taught those people, the people who purport to be the smartest can't figure out how to make higher education come alive virtually. We are in a society that dates virtually. We are in a society that um, marries in some cases virtually. We're in a society that shops virtually. We're in a society that does everything under the sun virtually, but we are supposed to believe that in the midst of a global pandemic, where the safest thing we can do is to keep people socially distanced and, and to act as if we care about their well being more than we care about some other things, that in that environment, we can't figure out how to create a rich and meaningful academic experience. Well, thankfully, we know that's not true. Thankfully, there are big L leaders out there who have embraced the better angels of their nature in an effort to lead us forward to a better society. And those, my friends, are big L leaders. So I want to spend some time now, now that we've talked about how to identify small L leaders, and let's, let's recap that. They will traffic in fear. They will lead you into dark corners with no idea how to find the light. They will also squander the power of their titles um, by fostering scarcity mindsets. Those are small L leaders. We all know them. We all have some in our lives. Now let me tell you how to defeat those individuals, how to embrace a bolder version of yourself, a bolder version of our society. Let's talk about how we become great because big L leaders are leaders who are destined for greatness. And if we are going to aspire for anything, we have no choice but to aspire for greatness. And let's talk about the five steps to becoming a big L leader. Number one, you must be courageous. Life will expand or contract based upon your relationship with fear. If you succumb to fear, if you embrace fear, if you let fear infect your soul, your life will become smaller and smaller and smaller. And it will do so 
because quite frankly, you have allowed it to do so. I'm not telling you facing your fear, uh, being courageous is the easiest thing to do. I am telling you it is the necessary thing to do. It is the only path to big L leadership. It is the place where big L leadership starts because big L leaders are people who are willing to risk losing in the pursuit of a greater victory. Small L leaders are people who just wanna keep it here and keep taking their small wins because their small wins feed their insecurities. There is no place for insecurity as the big L leader. You must face that fear. You must acknowledge its existence, but not be controlled by it, not be dominated by it. You must be courageous. Number one, the first step to becoming a big L leader is to be courageous, face your fears. Number two, rise to the occasion. One of the most extraordinary speeches in the history of this country was Teddy Roosevelt's speech at the Sorbonne where he talked about becoming men in the arena. I am a man of my time. So I view it as becoming men and women in the arena. It is necessary for us to engage, to rise to the occasion, not to sit on the sidelines to comment on how the brave man stumbles or errs in their actions. Anyone can write the story about how other people did what they did. I pity the people who rather write the stories of our era than create the stories of our era. It does not mean that there isn't a value or a place for the storyteller. There absolutely is, but not the storyteller who has never stood there and face the fire of making decisions that matter, right? You don't get to be the critic who, who, who never ever understood the courage it takes to engage. Big L leaders engage. They face their fears. They stand on the battlefield and they fight like hell for what they believe in. They, they fight to, to win. They fight knowing that they could lose, that they chances are they will stumble. But a stumble must never become a fall. And so as we go forward, learning how to be big L leaders, you must stand on the battlefield. You must put yourself in a position to rise to the occasion, to be tested, to find out if you have that stuff. And if you are defeated, to not stand there coward and broken, to learn the lesson in the defeat and to come back to the battlefield, to stand, to engage. At Paul Quinn College, we know what it's like to have been beaten and being, been abused and to come up short because we did that for many, many years. And we were left for dead. When I became president, we had 18 months to 24 months left before we were going to have to close our doors. Being small L leaders wasn't working for us. The status quo wasn't working for us. We couldn't do what everyone else did and get the same results. We had to become something different. We faced our fears. We asked ourselves the questions. What if we're wrong? What if we lose? And we determined that losing while daring greatly was just a risk that we were willing to take. But to lose by being small was one that we could never take. And so embracing our fear, being willing to rise to the occasion, being capable of getting in the arena led us to the third lesson of big L leadership. And that is to know your values, to have a set of values that can inspire you, that are honest, that are authentic, that are real. They they must be values that speak to the better part of our character. In the Quinite nation, 
we have a set of values, right? So we are a historically black college, but one of our foundational values is that you can be my kind without being my color. We think it is far more important that we find allies who believe what we believe. Those allies are many, many times black, but they are also many, many times Latino. They are also many, many times our Native American and Asian American brothers and sisters. They are many, many times our Anglo brothers and sisters, right? But we're going to give you a chance to prove that you can embrace us and our culture. And inviting people in from other cultures doesn't make you weak. It doesn't mean they're coming to take over your culture. I'm so secure in my culture that I am fine sharing my culture with others and learning about other people, people's cultures. It doesn't diminish me. It doesn't diminish our institution. Right? It doesn't diminish our society. It doesn't diminish our country. That is foolishness right? to fear people because they started out somewhere else is the sign of a small and petty individual. And it is the earmark of small L leaders. Big L leaders don't do that. We go to our values. You can be our kind and not be our color. Another set of our values in the Quinine Nation is we believe in the harder right over the easier wrong without apparent regard to self-interest. We will make the right decision time and time again, no matter how difficult it is. We believe in our institutional ethos of we over me. The needs of a community supersede the wants of an individual. You don't get to be selfish at Paul Quinn College and you do not get to be selfish as a big L leader, right? That is a fundamental rejection of all principles of big L leadership. But then we have four L's of Quinite leadership. And these, these are our guiding principles that that lead us forward and are foundational to our big L leadership mantra. Number one, lead places better than you found them. Lead places better than you found them. And every encounter and every engagement, people should be better from having come into contact with you. They should be better from having read your works or listened to your words or, or spent a moment in your company. That is your challenge, that is your charge. Make sure you leave places better than you found them. And, and that's a moment by moment test. You can always gauge if when you leave, someone is crying because you disappointed them, you hurt them, you have failed that test, right? So then go back, make it right, then go forward. So number one, leave places better than you found them. Number two, live a life that matters. You will have a legacy. People will speak of you when you are gone. What will they say? What will they talk about from this moment in time that you shared together? Right now, the clock is ticking on all of us. None of us created this mess, right? We did not create, well, some of us might've contributed to this mess by some of the decisions that we made, but we didn't create this. But whether or not it gets solved, whether or not we solve it, whether or not it's truly better, that's on us. That is on us. This moment is on us. And if in five years, people talk about this era and we have destroyed their prospects for a future, then we are the wrong ones. We are the people who didn't live up to our promise. We didn't live a life that mattered. Number three, leave from wherever you are. People like to believe that you have to be ordained a leader. You don't have to be ordained a leader. You start leading now. You prepare to be someone of consequence in your daily walk through life. That's essential because when you get the title, if you have not practiced, if you have not prepared yourself, then you will not be able to rise to the occasion. And we know that rising to the occasion is everything in the idea of becoming a big L leader. Now the fourth L is perhaps the most important and that is love something greater than yourself. That value is so fundamentally important because it leads you to the path of selflessness. It leads you to the path of frankly, righteousness and justice. And those who do not believe and do not have something that they love that is greater than themselves who cannot 
choose the harder right over the easier wrong. Those are individuals that continue to make decisions that punish people. They continue to make decisions that make people smaller and their lives smaller. And they continue to be people who waste the opportunity of leadership. Do not be those people. First step, be courageous. Second step, rise to the occasion. Third step, have a set of values that people can rally behind. The fourth step to becoming a big L leader is to be entrepreneurial, right? The greatest leaders in our country's history were leaders who were entrepreneurial in their thoughts and their actions. Shout out to Babson College for the amazing entrepreneurial thinking and entrepreneurial action edict. Those leaders looked at society and they remade it, which is the same thing that an entrepreneur does. They look at the landscape and they see a hole and then they move to fill that hole. Great big L leaders, they do that as well. They look at what people don't have and then they step forward to fill that gap. Right now, we are a country where leadership, failed leadership is running amok. It is at every level. It's in our schools, it's in our cities, it's in our states, it's at our federal level. We are filled with people who can't seem to, to really, really embrace entrepreneurial thought, finding ways to lead us out of difficult pathways. Your challenge, my challenge to you on that front is do not be those people. Be entrepreneurial in your thoughts. Look for ways to make a difference and make a difference in a hurry. Number five, the last step to how you can become a big L leader. Have a great team. No one travels this journey alone. No one leads by themselves. If you are someone and you are always by yourself, you are not a leader, you are a fool. You must be people that other people follow willingly, not because they're paid to, not because they're afraid not to, not for what you can do for them materially, they follow you because they trust you, because they believe in you, that they, they have looked at your ethical, comp your moral compass, your ethical spirit, and they have deemed it to be that which they can trust. Build a team that evaluates you on an ongoing basis, that is free to speak to you and give you their thoughts. I am disheartened by the countless numbers of institutions that I read about who have staff and faculty that don't feel as if their voices are being heard during this critical period, right? That's not right, right? This is a tough time. There are lots of fears right now. Part of our job as big L leaders is to be a balm for those fears, to listen, to engage, to build trust. You don't always have to have everyone go along with you, but you do, you do have to make sure that some people are following you and they're following you for the right reasons. So our time together is really just about up. And what I hope that you have taken from this is you must aspire to be a big L leader. The journey will not be easy. I did not tell you it would be easy. It should not be easy. You should be challenged enough that you are prepared when your moment comes. That is what I want for all of you. I want you to be ready when your moment comes because it will come, we will need you. And when we need you, when the siren call, or excuse me, the clarion call comes, you must be capable of hearing it, understanding it and leading your people forward. The steps to becoming a big L leader are simple. Be courageous, rise to the occasion, Understand your values, don't embrace scarcity. Have values that inspire people to follow you. Be entrepreneurial in your thoughts and your actions and cultivate a team, a team that you trust who will always speak truth to you. Do not become small L leaders who traffic in fear and scarcity and serve to divide instead of unite. Be people who unite, be people who are big enough for this moment.
Thank you for the opportunity of being with you. Uh, I know I will be back with you in a few minutes to answer all of your questions. I look forward to it and take care.